found scrawled in a leather-bound journal, pages yellowed with age. Rule 1. The house moves. Never trust what you see outside the windows. The view changes. The house travels. Don't try to make sense of it. Just know you're never where you think you are. Rule 2. Maintain order. Clean everything. Dust the shelves daily. Sweep the floors twice daily. Scrub the bathrooms until they shine. The house despises disorder. Leave a dirty dish in the sink, and the cellar door will creak open. Rule 3. Respect the boundaries. Never enter the cellar unless summoned. Don't attempt to break windows or doors. Don't try to signal to people outside. Don't try to harm the house. Breaking these rules has consequences. Rule 4. Accept the sacrifice. The house feeds on youth. Fighting it only makes it hungrier. Accept the aging process with grace, or it will take your years by force. Rule 5. The cycle must continue. When a new tenant arrives, you may leave. But you must ensure they enter willingly. The house requires consent. Most importantly, remember, the house always gets what it wants. Always. Macy stood before the Victorian house, her father's stolen duffel bag heavy with guilt and necessity. The morning fog clung to the weathered siding like ghostly fingers, peeling paint curling away from gray wood like dead skin. Her phone buzzed again, the fifteenth text from her father since she'd left before dawn. She ignored it, just as she'd ignored his increasing demands since her mother's death. The classified ad crinkled in her back pocket, newsprint smudging her fingers when she touched it. No phone number, just an address and a too-good-to-be-true rental price. She'd memorized the three-line ad during her finals week, holding it like a talisman of escape. Two rocking chairs flanked the front door, their wooden frames wrapped in cobwebs so thick they looked like burial shrouds. The porch steps groaned beneath her feet, each creak echoing her father's disappointed sighs. When she reached for the ancient brass doorbell, she noticed strange symbols carved into the doorframe, worn almost smooth by time, but still visible if you knew where to look. The door's metal hatch opened with the shriek of long unused hinges, revealing an elderly woman's face lined with years Macy couldn't count. Behind those eyes lurked something that made Macy's spine tingle. A desperate hope mixed with profound relief. What do you want? The woman's raspy voice carried an undertone of urgency that Macy would only understand much later. The foyer smelled of furniture polish and something else, something old and patient. Charlotte led Macy past a grandfather clock that ticked with mechanical precision, though Macy noticed its hands hadn't moved since she entered. The living room revealed itself like a museum of the Victorian era, complete with a velvet upholstered fainting couch and oil paintings in gilded frames. Each portrait's eyes seemed to follow their movement through the room. The previous tenants left most of the furniture, Charlotte explained, though something in her tone suggested this wasn't quite true. Her bony fingers traced patterns in the dust on a side table. The house prefers things to stay as they are. The dining room's massive oak table dominated the space, twelve chairs arranged with mathematical precision. A crystal chandelier hung above, though no light bulbs graced its ornate fixtures. Only candle stubs remained, their wax frozen in mid-drip. I don't use this room much, Charlotte said, hurrying them past. Not anymore. The kitchen proved to be a study in contradictions. Modern appliances sat awkwardly alongside ancient cooking implements. Cast iron pots and pans hung from ceiling hooks, their surfaces gleaming with recent use. The breakfast nook offered a view of an impossibly beautiful garden, though Macy could have sworn the flowers changed colors while she watched. Charlotte threw open the pantry door with theatrical flourish. Always fully stocked, she declared, the house provides. Shelves stretched from floor to ceiling, 
laden with cans and boxes bearing labels Macy didn't recognize. Some looked decades old, yet perfectly preserved. But it was the cellar door that commanded attention. Heavy oak, bound with black iron, its surface carved with the same strange symbols Macy had noticed on the front door frame. Charlotte's entire demeanor changed when they approached it. You don't want to go down there, she whispered, her earlier enthusiasm evaporating. The house doesn't like visitors in the cellar, unless it invites you. She hurried them upstairs before Macy could ask what that meant. The second floor landing creaked beneath their feet, though Macy noticed Charlotte's steps made no sound at all. Four bedroom doors stood sentinel along the hallway, their brass doorknobs polished to mirror brightness. The master bedroom's four-poster bed wore its canopy like a funeral shroud, heavy velvet drapes the color of dried blood. You can have any room except the one at the end, Charlotte said, indicating her own quarters. Though the house sometimes has preferences about these things, the attic door, when they passed it, bore a heavy padlock covered in verdigris. The key will find you, Charlotte said cryptically, when the house decides it's time. Throughout the tour, Macy noticed small details that seemed wrong, shadows that moved against the light, windows that showed different weather conditions, and the persistent feeling that the house itself was watching, evaluating, deciding. By the time Charlotte left her to settle in, Macy had counted 17 mirrors, though she could have sworn there were more when she looked again. She chose the bedroom across from the stairs, telling herself it was out of politeness rather than fear of being further from the exit. As she set her duffel bag on the bed, she heard Charlotte humming somewhere below, a lullaby that made her bones ache with sudden, inexplicable weariness. The humming had lulled Macy into an uneasy sleep, her dreams filled with shifting corridors and watching eyes. She woke to the sound of something heavy being dragged across hardwood floors, a rhythmic thump scrape that seemed to count down like a heartbeat. The digital display of her phone read 3.33 p.m., though the quality of light filtering through the lace curtains suggested either dawn or dusk no service bars. She hadn't had signal since entering the house, she realized with growing unease. Thump scrape, thump scrape. Macy crept to the landing, her sock feet silent on the aged wood. Below, Charlotte struggled with a large leather suitcase, its surface cracked and peeling like elderly skin. The old woman wore a different outfit than before, younger somehow, more modern. Her movements were quicker, more assured. Where are you going? Macy called out, her voice echoing strangely in the foyer. Charlotte turned, and Macy gasped. The woman's face had changed. Decades seemed to have melted away. Tears streamed down cheeks that now appeared only slightly older than Macy's own, though her hair remained steel gray. I'm going home, Charlotte sobbed her voice carrying both relief and guilt. I'm so sorry. Macy rushed down the stairs, but before she could reach the bottom, the front door slammed shut with a force that rattled the paintings on the walls. Then, like dominoes falling in slow motion, every door in the house began to close. Bedrooms, bathrooms, closets, each impact louder than the last until the sound became almost musical in its terrible rhythm. Bang, bang, bang. The temperature dropped noticeably. Macy's breath fogged in front of her face as she raced from window to window, trying handles that wouldn't turn, pushing against glass that felt more like steel. The heavy glass ashtray from the living room bounced off the bay window with a dull thud, not even leaving a scratch. Outside, Charlotte was nowhere to be seen. The street itself seemed to shift and blur. Buildings across the way morphing from Victorian homes to modern apartments and back again. A man walking his dog passed by, but when Macy screamed and pounded on the glass, 
he didn't even glance her way. His dog did, though, meeting her eyes with an all-too-human expression of pity before both dog and owner faded into mist. The grandfather clock in the foyer began to chime, though its hands still hadn't moved. Three thirty-three chimes, Macy counted, each one slightly off-key from the last. When the final note faded, she heard something else. A slow, deliberate creak from the kitchen. The cellar door was opening. No, Macy whispered, backing away. No, no, no. But the house had other plans. One by one, every other door slammed shut again, leaving only one path forward. The cellar gaped open like a hungry mouth, darkness breathing out the smell of wet earth and forgotten things. From somewhere in that darkness came the sound of Charlotte's humming. But it wasn't Charlotte anymore. It was something older, wearing her voice like a borrowed coat. The house had made its first move. The game had begun. The bedroom Charlotte had occupied felt wrong in a way Macy couldn't immediately identify. The furniture was identical to the other rooms. The same heavy Victorian pieces. The same thick curtains. But something about the air itself seemed charged with lingering desperation. A cardboard box sat centered perfectly on the bed, its flaps arranged with geometric precision. Inside, Macy found clothes still bearing department store tags, though the prices were listed in dollars and cents she'd never seen before. Toiletries with unfamiliar brands. A tube of lipstick in eternal rose that smelled of copper and crushed flowers. Beneath it all lay a single sheet of cream-colored paper, the handwriting unnaturally precise. Keep what you want and put the rest in the attic. When Macy tried to leave without the box, the door slammed shut with enough force to rattle her teeth. The temperature plummeted. Frost began forming on the mirror, crystallizing in patterns that looked disturbingly like faces. Only when she picked up the box did the door ease open with an almost satisfied creak. The attic door waited for her, padlock now mysteriously absent. The stairs protested each step with groans that sounded almost human. The attic itself stretched impossibly far, much larger than the house's exterior should have allowed. Dust motes danced in shafts of light that seemed to come from nowhere illuminating dozens upon dozens of boxes. Each box told a story. A poodle skirt from the fifties, still swaying slightly though there was no breeze. A peace sign necklace from the sixties that hummed faintly when touched. A walkman from the eighties that played only static. Static that sometimes formed words if you listened too closely. The boxes went back further than should have been possible. Civil War era bonnets colonial stays and petticoats. Things older still, their origins lost to time. Each box contained someone's life, preserved like insects in amber. In Charlotte's box, beneath a University of State sweatshirt, Macy found the college ID. The photo showed a young woman with bright eyes and a confident smile, dated just last year. Charlotte Morris, it read. Class of 2023. Oh, God, Macy whispered, understanding blooming like poison flowers in her mind. The elderly woman who had greeted her wasn't Charlotte's mother or grandmother. She was Charlotte, aged decades in a single year. The house had rules. The house had appetites. And Macy was about to learn both, whether she wanted to or not. From below came the sound of chains dragging across hardwood. The cellar was calling, and this time, Macy knew she couldn't refuse its invitation. On her way out of the attic, she noticed something she'd missed before. Each box had a small brass plaque, tarnished with age. The dates grew closer together as they approached the present. The house was getting hungrier. Charlotte's plaque was still shiny and new. Next to it sat an empty space, waiting for Macy's name. The cellar steps descended into darkness that seemed to swallow light. Each wooden tread bore deep grooves 
as if countless feet had worn paths of desperate escape attempts. The smell hit Macy first, mildew and decay, yes, but underneath that was something sweeter, cloying, like overripe fruit left too long in summer heat. Her phone's flashlight revealed walls of rough stone, glistening with moisture that seemed to pulse in the beam. Water dripped somewhere in a rhythmic patterns that almost formed words. Tap, tap, pause, tap. Like Morse code for the damned. The cellar stretched far beyond what should have been possible, just like the attic above. Support pillars rose from the dirt floor like ancient trees, their surfaces carved with the same strange symbols she'd seen throughout the house. Fresh scratches marked the wood at varying heights, some at eye level, others low to the ground, as if their makers had been dragged down while carving. The beam of light caught something that made her stumble backward, a hand reaching out from the darkness. But no, not a hand, a body. The first of twelve, arranged with terrible precision against the far wall, mummified remains preserved by some power she didn't want to understand. All women, all posed as if in conversation, frozen mid-gesture for eternity. Behind them, the walls told their stories. Hundreds of messages scratched, painted, and carved into stone and wood. I will obey. I will obey. I will obey. Written in what looked like lipstick, the color of dried blood. The house feeds. Don't fight it. Fighting makes it hungry. Carved so deep, the letters were like wounds in the wood. Time is different here. Yesterday I was twenty. Today my hands are wrinkled. Tomorrow. This message trailed off into desperate scribbles. The house provides when you abide. Written in elegant script, as if the author had finally accepted their fate. Count the chimes. Always count the chimes. 333 means hide. 444 means clean. 555 means... The rest was scratched out violently. But it was the largest message, carved across the ceiling in letters three feet high, that made Macy's blood run cold. The house always gets what it wants. The twelve bodies, she realized, were object lessons. Warnings. These were the ones who fought too hard, who refused to learn the rules. Their preservation wasn't mercy, it was documentation. When Macy's flashlight beam caught the face of the nearest body, she recognized the hairstyle, a beehive from the 1960s. The woman's dress still held traces of its original blue color. Around her neck hung a chain, supporting a tarnished key that looked very familiar, the attic key. Each prisoner had worn it in turn. I understand, Macy whispered to the darkness. I'll follow the rules. The cellar door at the top of the stairs creaked open wider, letting in a sliver of light. The house was satisfied. For now. But as Macy climbed the stairs on shaking legs, she heard something that might have been a whisper, might have been the wind. For now. Over the next week, Macy learned the house's rules through increasingly dire lessons. Each infraction brought swift consequences. Each compliance earned temporary peace. The house was a meticulous teacher. Rule one revealed itself when she tried signaling through windows to passing pedestrians. The glass simply turned opaque, like cataracts forming in ancient eyes. When she attempted to break a window, the house removed all oxygen from the room until black spots danced in her vision. The message was clear. Escape attempts were futile. Through the windows, she watched reality shift like channels on a broken TV. One moment, horse-drawn carriages clattered past on cobblestone streets. The next, sleek autonomous vehicles glided by on smooth asphalt. Sometimes she saw oceans where buildings should be, deserts where gardens grew. The house wasn't just in one place or time. It existed everywhere and everywhere, feeding across centuries. 
Rule 2 emerged from a single unwashed coffee cup left in the sink. The water had turned black as ink, then begun crawling up the sides like living paint. Within hours, every surface in the kitchen was covered in a film of greasy residue that spelled out clean in endless repetition. The cellar door had creaked open invitingly. After that, Macy cleaned obsessively. She learned the house's preferences, clockwise dusting patterns, counterclockwise mopping. Sunlight had to touch every mirror at precisely 12.17 p.m. The brass fixtures required polishing with specific circular motions, seven times for doorknobs, 13 for light fixtures. Breaking these patterns meant starting over. Rule three proved the most painful. During her third week, frustration drove her to attempt burning her way out. She'd built a small fire in the fireplace, planning to let it spread. The house responded by turning the flames green, then drawing them out of the fireplace like a snake being charmed. The fire had danced through the air, scorching messages into the walls. The house cannot be harmed. The house remembers. The house punishes. She spent three days locked in the cellar after that, with only the mummified bodies for company. They seemed to shift positions when she wasn't looking, their frozen faces taking on expressions of sympathy or mockery depending on her angle of view. The pantry remained fully stocked, though labels changed daily. Cans of soup became jars of preserved meats, became boxes of hardtack from long-dead centuries. The house provided, but even eating became a test of obedience. Meals had to be taken at specific times, breakfast at 7.07 a.m., lunch at 1.11 p.m., dinner at 6.06 p.m. Missing a meal meant hunger pangs that felt like internal knives. Eating between meals brought worse consequences. Time itself became fluid. Clocks ran backward or sideways. The sun rose in the north and set in the east. Sometimes Macy would blink and find hours had passed, marked only by new wrinkles in her skin or gray hairs on her brush. The house was teaching her its own peculiar metabolism of time and age. Each morning, she recited the rules into the largest mirror on the second floor. The glass would fog with her breath, the condensation forming into corrections if she spoke them wrong. I will not seek escape, for the house is everywhere. I will maintain order, for chaos feeds its hunger. I will accept its authority, for rebellion brings darkness. I will learn its rhythms, for time is its plaything. I will endure its appetite, for my youth is its feast. The house listened, the house approved, the house waited. By the third month, Macy's reflection had become a stranger. The bathroom mirror, once a mundane fixture, now served as a daily record of her accelerated decay. Dark circles beneath her eyes deepened into permanent bruise-like shadows. Her skin hung looser each morning, like clay slowly succumbing to gravity. She started marking her deterioration in a journal she found in the library, its previous pages filled with similar observations from past inhabitants. Day 89. Found three gray hairs this morning. By evening, half my head had turned silver. Day 103. The arthritis came suddenly. Knuckles swollen like old tree knots. Hard to grip the mop now, but the house still demands cleanliness. Day 124. My teeth feel loose. The bathroom mirror showed me my grandmother's face today. I'm only 22. Macy added her own entries to this grim chronicle. Day 91. The house feeds in cycles. The grandfather clock chimes at 3.33 a.m. every night now. Each chime pulls something from me. Youth, vitality, time itself. I can feel it happening, like sand running through an hourglass. Day 110. Found Charlotte's detailed notes, hidden in a false bottom of her jewelry box. She lasted 371 days before her replacement came. 
the ones in the cellar didn't make it past 60. The trick, she wrote, is to feed the house slowly, give it what it wants in small doses, like rationing blood to a vampire. The house's hunger manifested in peculiar ways. Metal oxidized at her touch. Plants withered when she tended them, their vitality seemingly transferring to the house's ancient wooden bones. Even the dust she swept seemed to carry fragments of her youth, sparkling with an unnatural vitality as she cleaned. She learned to recognize the warning signs of the house's feeding cycles, the taste of copper in the tap water, clocks running backward for exactly seven minutes, the sound of children laughing in empty rooms, her reflection remaining in mirrors seconds after she walked away, the smell of birthday candles being extinguished. Each cycle aged her months in minutes. The house consumed time itself, storing it in its walls like a battery holds charge. Sometimes, in the deep night, she could hear it digesting, a sound like years being ground to dust between ancient teeth. The pantry began stocking her new needs without comment. Joint pain remedies, reading glasses, cream for age spots. The house provided as it took, a twisted parody of care even as it consumed her. But Macy had learned from Charlotte's notes and the seller's warnings. She developed strategies, rigorous exercise to maintain muscle tone, careful attention to nutrition, meditation techniques to slow her perceived time, strategic compliance with the house's demands, rationing her youth like a precious resource. Yet still, she aged. The house's appetite was patient but relentless. By day 200, her driver's license photo looked like it belonged to a different person entirely. Some young woman she'd once known, or perhaps would know, in the house's twisted timeline. The worst part was feeling her memories begin to blur. Was she 22 or 62? Had her mother died last year or three decades ago? Time meant nothing to the house, and increasingly, it meant nothing to her either. The knock came exactly one year after Macy's arrival. She was in the breakfast nook, watching autumn leaves fall upward against the laws of physics when she heard it. Three precise raps against the front door, just as she had knocked 365 days ago. Her joints protested as she rose from the chair, bones creaking like the house's ancient floorboards. The mirror in the foyer showed her what a year in the house had wrought. Silver hair wrapped in a neat bun, face lined with decades of artificial age, eyes carrying the weight of compressed time. Through the small metal hatch, she saw youth incarnate, a redhead with bright eyes and a newspaper clutched in her freckled hands. The classified ad. The same one that had drawn Macy, though she now understood it appeared only when the house hungered for fresh vitality. Hi, the girl said brightly. I'm here about the room for rent. The house's grip loosened slightly. Macy felt a surge of bitter triumph mixed with guilt. Freedom beckoned, paid for with another's innocence. She thought of Charlotte, understanding now her tears of relief and shame. For the first time in a year, the front door opened willingly. Cool autumn air caressed Macy's aged face like a forgotten lover's touch. She could step out now, walk away, reclaim whatever years the house hadn't yet devoured. But the price would be this girl's unknowing sacrifice. The house's hunger rippled through the walls. The grandfather clock began to chime, 3.33 in the afternoon. Time to choose. Are you okay? The redhead asked, noticing Macy's hesitation. Memories cascaded through Macy's mind. The cellar's grim trophies, Charlotte's desperate escape, the rules carved in wood and bone. A year of watching her youth drain away like water through cupped hands. She could warn the girl. Break the cycle. But the house's message throbbed in her temples. The house always gets what it wants. If this girl left, another would come. The house's hunger was eternal. 
I've never felt better. Macy lied, her aged voice carrying echoes of Charlotte's rasp. Why don't you come inside and let me give you the tour? The redhead stepped across the threshold, full of hope and plans. The door swung shut with the finality of a tomb being sealed. In the attic, a new brass plaque appeared on an empty box, waiting to be filled. Sarah Mitchell, 2024. The house settled around them with a sound like satisfied sighing. In the cellar, twelve mummified witnesses maintained their eternal silence. On the second floor, clocks began running backward. And in the breakfast nook, Macy's abandoned coffee cup left a ring on the table. A perfect circle, like the end meeting the beginning, again and again and again. The cycle continued, the house fed, time flowed ever onward, or perhaps backward, in the hungry darkness of number 55 Sycamore Way.